Good morning. Welcome to Oak Bend Church. Uh, for all of you that uh, brave the weather to come here, and for those of you that are joining us online, welcome. Glad that you're here today. Happy Mother's Day to all of those who are our mothers. It's good to have you here. Looks like uh, God has blessed you with sunshine in such abundance that it's uh, concentrated into droplets and falling from the sky. Uh, so uh, thanks for being here today. Have a couple of announcements for you this morning. Uh, first of all, next week, next Sunday, uh, we're privileged to have Brent Preston come visit us. Brent is one of the missionaries that we support. He and his family live in Spain. He is uh, with uh, the organization called TEAM, the Evangelical Alliance Mission. Uh, Brent is the uh, senior director for missions in uh, North Africa, let's see if I get this right, North Africa, uh, Middle East, Central uh, Asia, and Eastern Asia, so that whole area there. And so he's going to be with us. He'll be bringing us a message from God's Word as well as giving us an update on his ministries. Uh, and also, uh, we're going to be having a little time after the second service, uh, some time of fellowship. Uh, it's been a while since we as a family have been able to fellowship together, so we're going to go ahead and order some pizza, have some time. Hopefully the weather will be nice and we can do it outside. Uh, but we'll have some time together, and also that'll give us some time not only to fellowship with one another, but talk some with Brent on a more intimate level, get to hear more about what's going on with his ministries, have some questions and answers and things like that. So I hope you'll join us uh, next week with uh, Brent uh, after the second service and, and during the second service. We do need to know how many pizzas we need to order. Uh, so there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board over there. Or you can contact the office, either drop us uh, an email or give us a call. Let us know how many of you are going to be here so we can uh, order pizzas. There will be regular and gluten-free pizzas uh, available there. Okay, so hope to see you for that. Another announcement, second announcement. Uh, you know, during this uh, pandemic, it's been hard to, to get together. And, and so our quiz team has also had a difficult time getting together and having some of our quizzes. They have been faithfully studying uh, throughout this time, uh, braving through Zoom or Discord, phone calls and meetings, or meeting remotely, or meeting here together, social distances and wearing masks. Uh, but then a lot of times the quiz offs were either canceled or they weren't able to go to them for the whole past year. But yesterday, we were able to go to a quiz off at, in Fort Wayne at our sister church in Pine Hills in Fort Wayne for a quiz off competition. Uh, we were studying over the last section of the Gospel of Matthew, so chapters 24 through 28. Uh, we went there and we competed. There were 15 senior high teams and 13 junior high teams. We only have a senior high team, so I'll talk about them. Uh, the way the competition works, if you remember, is that it's a round robin initially. So each quiz team quizzes against four other uh, quiz teams chosen at random. Uh, and then after those four quizzes, they look at the scores and the win-loss records and things like that, uh, and they pick the best eight teams to go. Okay, so before I tell you the results, I want to show you a quick little clip, get you a little bit of a feel for what the, what it looks like and how well they did. Matthew 26, 6. In whose home was Jesus? And the preceding question. Who, to whom, and the preceding question. Question. Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to, to celebrate the Passover with this. Now, how was the first time to that house? This was the God gives us to his disciples an increasing question was, Lord, where do you want us to prepare a place to screw the Passover? And where do you want us to prepare the Passover to you? Correct. Good job. All right. All right. All right. All right. Question number 20 is going to be a location question. Question. His appearance was like this. Uh, his appearance was like this. In this case, Matthew 28, verse 3. Yeah. All right, now, baby. Okay, round four is open to 40 and uh, our phone lines in. I left a message. Marco. 
Yeah, so uh, we picked some uh, tough competition we were paired against in the first uh, four quizzes, so uh, we didn't get to make it into the final eight. Three of the teams we played made it into the final eight, but that's uh, the luck of the draw in uh, tough competition. So we didn't make it into the final eight, but the quizzers did a really good job. Uh, so let's see, so who's, who's here from our quiz team? Uh, Martha's here somewhere. I think that's there. Stand up. Madeline, I see her. So even though they didn't they didn't win the whole championship yesterday, they've uh, they've acquired a lot of God's word into their heart, and I, uh, I appreciate that so much. Uh, so the next uh, quiz season will start again in the fall. Uh, quizzing is open to everyone in junior high and senior high level. Next fall we'll start off with the Book of Hebrews, and also we'll do First and Second Peter. So that uh, will bring the worship team up. Morning. Well, first off, we just want to say Happy Mother's Day um, to all our moms here and to all our moms at home. Um, so yeah, we just want to invite you to stand with us if you're willing and worship with us today. Um, Let me see light. 
me in prayer. God, I just lift all these people up to you. I lift up our moms and all the kids that they have been raising or have raised. Um, I just give you the glory for working in them and um, just raising us so well. God, please just be in our midst. Fill this room and just let us know what you have for us. Let us know what you want us to know through this time of worship today. Um, help our hearts just be to, to be open to what you have for us today. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you here today. Those of you that are joining us online, we're so glad that you're here uh, this morning. Uh, before we look at the scriptures together, I want to take a few minutes this morning. Uh, we want to say a little bit about our moms and honor them. And I clearly recognize that these few moments are not going to do in any way uh, make up for the honor that our moms are due, but uh, we still need to acknowledge that. And I think days like this have importance uh, to them. Uh, to get us started this morning, we're going to see a, a short video. Let me say something about the video this morning. It is tongue in cheek. Um, it, it's supposed to be funny, but I'm, I'm thinking if you're a mom or you're a parent, uh, you are going to be able to see yourself in this. So let's just watch it together, okay? Lord, I wish I had something to do. <laughs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look. An empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it out of your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed. You're just going to sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's all pull on our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come home and bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're going to be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Fight, fight, fight. The floor of this vehicle is so clean that I can't believe it. Well, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. So if you're a mom or a parent, you can probably identify with that, can't you? Uh, and so, yeah, we watch it, we laugh, and it's funny, but let's be honest, uh, sometimes being a mom, it's, it's hard, hard work, and uh, it's difficult, and uh, we need to honor that. Um, I remember a guy by the name of Tony Campola, he once told a story when he was a little fella, him and another boy decided that they would sneak into one of the stores in their a community that was closed. Uh, they broke in. Let's just put it what it was. Uh, but they went in not to take anything out. They just thought it would be fun to change all of the price tags in the store. And so they did. And so they spent a couple hours going through just changing everything. And then they left. You can imagine what the next uh, morning was like when the store opened. It was just utter chaos. People coming up with things that were these little bitty trinkets and the price on them was just enormously high and then these very important items and the prices on them were extremely low and i tell you that because i think that's the way we do life sometimes and i think it's the way our culture does with things we, we tend to undervalue what's really important and overvalue what isn't all that important at all sometimes and I think maybe if you're a mom or a parent in general, you sometimes, uh, you wonder, you probably wonder sometimes it's worth it. It's hard. It's difficult. And sometimes you don't see the immediate results of your work. Uh, just a little reminder. God usually has in our lives seasons where we have to sow and then seasons where we reap. And uh, sometimes we have to do a lot of sowing uh, before we see 
reaping. Uh, I think that's why the Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing, uh, but continue to sow in due season. He said you reap if you faint or not. So I think days like this are reminders, Mom, uh, that yeah, you are important, particularly in the eyes of God. If you're familiar with Proverbs 31, it is the chapter about the woman who cares for her husband, cares for her children, gives of herself. And there's a line in that, uh, in that chapter that talks about God's value of that lady. And he says, if you find someone like that, she's more valuable than rubies. Uh, in ancient times, rubies was among some of the most valuable jewels you could possess. So if you wonder uh, what your value is, in God's eyes, you're more valuable than rubies. And for those of us that had moms and wives like that, they should be that way in our eyes too. I would love to pray over you this morning, so if you'd give me that privilege, can I do that right now? Heavenly Father, we wanna, wanna thank you today for the gift of our moms, uh, and not just our physical moms, but Lord, I think about our spiritual moms. How many of us have had other ladies in the faith that have shaped our lives over time, influenced us, um, changed the trajectory of our lives. And Lord, today we thank you for them. Uh, I know at times it, it can seem difficult as a parent, and I'm sure as a mom, day in and day out with those kids, We'd like to pray today for your sustaining grace to them, for your reminder to them today of the way in which you see them, the value that they hold in your economy, in your workings, in your plans. And may they be encouraged today to continue to sow bountifully, knowing that in due time we reap if we don't faint. Father, may your hand of blessing rest upon them today and every day. Pray and we ask that in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, and before we finish, Mom, one of the ways we want to honor you as you leave today outside those doors over there, uh, there is a small uh, gift there for you. It is um, it's, it's a frame, and inside the frame is uh, a verse of Scripture. And actually, it was done by one of our own moms here. It was done by J Jessica St. John. She is a hand lettering artist. That's what she does. And so she put together a verse and Diane helped put it inside frame uh, for you mom. Something just for you to keep around and maybe particularly on those difficult days, uh, it is a reminder of who is your strength and where your help comes from. So please, as you leave today, pick one of those up for yourself. And uh, I know there's a number of ladies here, but there's also a number of guys. So can we take a moment and give our wives and moms a big hand today? Well, let me invite you, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn them to the uh, Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. We're going to continue on with our series on discipleship. And yes, I know today is Mother's Day, so let me say something about that. Uh, I don't know if you recognize it, uh, since we're going to talk about a, a, another aspect of discipleship today. Uh, but motherhood and discipleship have something in common. Uh, what is at their very essence is in common. So hopefully today, while we are going to talk about discipleship, uh, you can think about as a mother, how does this work into my life and how well am I doing this with what God has given me? I think most of us, not. I know this is not always true, but I think many of us, when we think of our moms, uh, a lot of good thoughts and good words run through our minds. We think of things like love and sacrifice and care and compassion and a whole lot more. But I'd like to suggest to you that there is a word today that is at the essence of what discipleship is about and also what motherhood is about. Uh, there was a poet by the name of William Ross Wallace, and I think he captured in a poem that he wrote on motherhood, I think he captured the essence of what motherhood is about. So let me just read you a little bit of, uh, of his poem. He said this, he said, blessings on the hand of women, 
angels guard its strength and grace in the palace, cottage, hovel, oh, no matter where the place. Would that storms never assailed it, rainbows ever gently curled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. He captured the essence of motherhood, particularly in those last two lines. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Because whatever other word we think about moms, love, sacrifice, compassion, care, they actually all roll into a single word. And I think that word is influence. At the heart of what it is to be a mom, it is to be an influencer. She is involved in influencing the generation to come. And moms... And dads were among God's first influencers. In fact, if you look at Scripture, from the time that it opens, God begins this work of putting his influencers into a broken, fallen world. It starts with parents, but it very quickly moves as you move through Genesis and into Exodus, it moves into a nation that is to become an influencer for God in the world. And that doesn't stop. When we get over into the New Testament, it continues in this issue that we're talking about today, and that is the issue of discipleship. And we've been looking at it from a couple of different angles, recently costs and rewards, but today I want us to think about discipleship from the in, uh, angle of influence. Because as we're going to see in the verses that we're looking at this morning, if we just boil them down to one single sentence, this is what the truth would be in these verses this morning. We're going to put it up, and that is simply this. We have been called by him to influence others for him. Okay. The reason God calls you, the reason God influenced you to become a part of what he's doing in the world is so that you then would influence the others that God has put around you. And the question becomes today, are we good influencers or bad? You might recall we talked about the heart of the Christian life being discipleship. When you are a Christian, okay, you don't become a disciple later. You are a disciple. That comes immediately with that call and that acceptance. But the outworking, the very essence of discipleship is that you become an influencer. Now, chapter 5, beginning at chapter 5, and really through chapter 7 in Matthew, we have something known as the Sermon on the Mount. Many of us are familiar, at least, with that term. But verse 1 of chapter 5 tells us who Jesus speaks this to, and he doesn't speak this to everybody. He speaks it to his own. Bible says that he called his disciples and he took them up on a mountain and he sits down and he begins to talk to them about the issue of influence. But what he starts with is what brings about their influence and that is their lifestyle. In chapter 5 verses 3 through 12, Jesus unpacks what we know of as the Beatitudes, but it's ways of living. It's ways of living out your life, and if you read those, they are at times very, very different than the way the culture will do life. And it's because of that that Jesus speaks the words that we're going to focus down on this morning in chapter 5, and that is verses 13 through 16. Look at those with me this morning. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says you have been called, you have been influenced to discipleship so that you then can influence your part of the world for his kingdom. And Jesus uses two things to make us think about our influence. He uses salt 
and he uses light. Now, we've already talked a little bit about salt, if you've been here for this series. Salt in ancient times was highly valued. They paid people in salt. I, I mentioned recently, it's where we get that idea of that person's not worth their salt. That's where that comes from. But salt had two purposes. It flavors and it preserves. It kept healthy and edible certain types of food because they didn't have refrigeration as we think of today. They didn't have refrigerators. Now, from a scriptural standpoint, the world, which is not the globe we live on, but the values, the ways of life that don't coincide with God's word, a life that leaves God on the periphery or totally outside of any thought, the Bible reminds us that that isn't spiritually healthy, that isn't spiritually good, and that doesn't lead to any good eternal endings. Now here's the thing, every one of us starts in that place. When we come into this world, we come in with it with a bent toward wrong, and as we grow and we can make choices, we usually choose against God. We choose life on my terms, my way, and a lot of times we may think about God, but if we're honest, God's at the periphery. He's not sitting here at the center of my life, and everything else rotates around it. But then God enters our life. God moves up on us. God opens our minds and our hearts to his way and to his truth and to his grace and to his goodness. He influences us to come into his kingdom. And he does that so, so that, that we live in a way that we show a different way of life. We show the kingdom's values. We show what life with God at the center looks like when it's good and when it is just lousy. We show them what life that's spiritually healthy looks like and help them to understand that's the life that leads to an eternally good ending. So Jesus says you're salt. But then Jesus also mentions light. And notice Jesus mentions right out, he uses this thing about a town or a, a town or a city built on a hill can't be hidden. Now, if you lived in Jesus' day, and remember all of Jesus' first followers were Jewish, they were within Jerusalem, if you lived there, you would know your city, by geography, sets on a hill. Okay, there were no street lamps, no flashlights, so when you traveled out in the countryside, it was pitch dark. And if you were caught out traveling at night, that was a frightening time. And so imagine how it would be as you come up over the ridge and there on the hill is the city you're headed to and it's just lit up. Imagine how wonderful that would be. It would allow you to see in the darkness. Jesus says, that's the way it is for my people. They live in a world that is wrapped in spiritual darkness. In fact, Jesus says this in John 12, 46. He talks about the world lying in spiritual darkness. And some of us may think, you know what? The world's getting a little darker day by day. And maybe that's true. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 seems to indicate that as we are moving through time toward the coming of Christ, he doesn't necessarily picture the world and its darkness is getting better. He kind of pictures it as getting a little worse. But he says, look, God has opened your eyes. God has changed your heart so that you can see his ways. And now what God's done is taken you and he's taken you out of the darkness given you his light, and then he's turned around and put you right back in the midst of it so that you shine for him. And here's the thing. You may be serving today, and you may be working today in a dark place. There's not a lot of God there. And sometimes you think, I'd rather be about anywhere than here. Well, think about this. Maybe you're there because God needs light and salt in that place. Notice he says you, that's plural, 
And it's emphatic. In other words, you are. You. You, my people, you're the light. You're the salt. I don't have plan B here. Here's plan A. It's the church. It's the people I influence out of the world. You're my salt. You're my light. You're that out in the workplace. You're that in your home. But that is what you are. And by the way, just young people, heads up here for a minute. Um, some of you are graduating. Some of you will be. Some of you uh, are probably thinking about what does God want to do with my life? If you aren't thinking that and you're a believer, you should be thinking, how does God want to use me? And I would like to encourage you not to shy away from the position of influence that you may be able to have or a field of study just because there's not a lot of Christians in it. Because that's the places that need the light and the salt. And hey, moms and dads, what a great opportunity to encourage your kids if they've got the aptitude and the gifting to think about in those areas being an influencer for Jesus. Listen, God calls his people and God equips his people in all different ways to stick them back in a world that needs salt in a world that needs light. All through the Bible, you find people in different places, places some of us would never imagine being, but God does. And God puts them there. And listen, whatever you are today, whatever your job title is, I want to tell you, you need to add to that influencer if you're a believer, because that is what you are called to be. You're called to be an influencer. You are called by him to influence others for him. But here's the thing. The thing is, are we going to do it well? Or are we not going to do it well? Because if you're a believer and people know it, they're going to watch. They're going to watch it if they're your kids all the way up to the people you're rubbing shoulders with in the office or on the line or wherever you're at. It's just how good we're doing it. So I want us to think about that for just a few minutes this morning. And I want to take a few minutes to kind of talk about what I'm going to call insights for influencers. And I want to give you four words to think about as you think about being an influence, whether that's your home or whether that is outside and in, in, on the job somewhere. Here's the first word, and that is the word tension. Because if you're going to be an influencer and you're going to stand for Christ, yeah, there's going to be a tension that you have to wrestle with in life on some level almost all the time. And Jesus speaks about it right here. Notice what he says, verse 13. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So Jesus says, look, you're salt. But you need to be careful that you don't become less salty than you're meant to be. And Jesus draws right out of his day. There was a, a type of a crystal or a stone when you would pick up salt that looked almost like it. But if you mixed it with the salt, it tended to take away some of the salt's saltiness. It lost some of its ability to do what it was meant to do. Jesus says, when you live in your culture, you need to be careful that you don't lose some of your saltiness. And then he says the very same thing here in verse 14 about light. Or verse 15, really. He says, look, people don't light a lamp in a house and then put a bowl over it. That's not the point of light. It's not to cover it up. It's to let the light out. And what Jesus reminds us of or warns us of, really, is that living our lives in a world that as we try to influence it, we need to understand it's going to try to influence us back. It is going to seek to reduce our saltiness and dim our light on some level. And we need, we need to just recognize that tension's there as we're living our Christian lives. Now look, one of the answers that Christians have unfortunately given to this sometimes has been, well, let's just withdraw. 
Okay, let's withdraw from the culture. And sadly, we have withdrawn from areas of the culture. And so we can't really complain. You know, the culture is falling apart if we're not in it to try to help keep it at least partly together. We kind of live in a world today where we have a Christian everything. We have a Christian subculture that you can live in. And listen, I'm not against Christian things. Okay, I like Christian bookstores and I like Christian merchandise and I, I get that. And I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but I think we need to realize that God's plan for us is not to circle our wagons, hunger down, and wait till Jesus comes. Okay, And I'm going to say something as a pastor, and there may not be many people show up to church next Sunday after this, but listen, you should not be spending all of your life and time in church. Okay? Now, I'd like for you to come, and I hope you'll be here on Sundays, but you need to do more than all of your life is church. Listen, here's why we come to church. Yes, it is to be together. Yes, it is to fellowship. Yes, it is to learn. It is to grow. But all of that is so we leave those doors and walk into our world, walk into our home, and we salt it and we light it. That's why we come to church. It's not to hide away. Okay, we're not put here to hide and wait till Jesus comes. We're put here to learn and grow. And clearly from these verses, Jesus does not call us to that option. He calls us to stand firm, stay right wherever he's put us with all its difficulties, all its questions of conscience, and all of these decisions we've got to make. And listen, we think, yeah, well, what about our home, though? It's not so hard at home. Yeah, sometimes it is. Particularly as your kids get harder or your kids go down ways that you don't want them to go, it will be hard sometimes to hold the line and say, I can't do that. We're still not going to go there. You're going to feel the tension. It doesn't matter where you're at. You're going to feel the tension. So how do we handle the tension? I got the answer, I think, for it. Uh, the way we do it is with the Word of God. The psalmist said this, Psalm 119, 105, Your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. Listen, our ability to influence in our homes, outside our homes, in the world, is tied to the interaction that we have with the Word of God. So you just can't get rid of the Word of God. It, it's, it's there, and we've got to connect with it to influence well. Because it's in the Word that we find, here's where the lines are. And by the way, there are lines that we cannot cross as Christians. You do realize that, don't you? There are. There are some lines we cannot go over. And it doesn't matter where the culture goes, we're never going to be able to pass those lines and be faithful. But there's also things sometimes that we make a big deal about that God just doesn't give a care about. And the better we know the Bible, the better we're going to know where the lines are and where we can fit in and give some grace and space. Okay, I'm going to tell you a guy that does this well in the Bible. In fact, I'm reading through it right now, and that is the book of Daniel. Daniel is a young man, probably about 17, in a foreign culture that is thoroughly pagan. He serves a pagan king in a pagan court in a dark land, and he navigates that darkness. And he is a light and he salt. How does he do that? You will go and read Daniel and you will find there are several mentions of him interacting with the word of God. That's where Daniel knows here's the line I can't cross. Here's what God doesn't care about and I can slide right in there and keep moving. So we got to wrestle with tension. Here's the second thing this morning we need to think about and that is trouble. First, uh, Peter, in his first letter, writes these words to the disciples of Jesus who are trying to live out their faith in a world that isn't always receptive to it. We'll put it up here. It's 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Notice what he says. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter says to them and to us, listen, if you're committed to being an influencer, you're committed to living out your faith, then you need to realize there is not any guarantee it will be easy. There's not a guarantee it will be well received. 
And there's not a guarantee that we will forever live in a place and in a way that we have the protected rights that we do. Because in Peter's day, they didn't have any protected rights. Now, I know today, living in our country, some of us feel like Christianity is losing its kind of its hold and its status that it's known in American life. And that may be true, but we need to recognize something this morning. Uh, the church in the West and the church in America has enjoyed a tremendous privilege and protection that most Christians throughout history have never, ever known. So we are an anomaly. Okay, this is not normally the way it is, but we're blessed right now that it is this way. We've really known very little persecution. And listen, sometimes what we call persecution isn't. And, I, and, and the reason I say that is because particularly today, I hear that kind of thing thrown around a lot. So let me help us here. Every question about your faith is not persecution. Sometimes people are asking you because they want to know, and sometimes because they think you're weird. Okay, but it's not always persecution. They just don't get it. Every person who sees something different than us is not persecuting us. That's part of living in a pluralistic world. And that's why if you know your faith, you have a great opportunity in this world to speak. And last of all, every ruling that doesn't go our way is not persecution. Now, it might come to that, and I think we need to think about that. We need to be ready for that. It may come to a day. Yes, here in this land where speaking out for your faith may cost you, it may cost us as a church. That's par for the course. We just need to understand that. Here's a third word we need to think about. And, and, and this one, I think, goes whether we're in our home or out in the world. How about our attitude? Nothing can undo your witness faster with an already skeptical world than a poor attitude. Peter, whom we just read, actually also spoke about this. Peter spoke about a lot of things. He had no trouble speaking. Uh, I want you to hear what he said. We'll put it up here. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. In other words, set him apart. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. To give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Paul says when people look at your life, and notice he starts with how you're living, not what you're saying. There was a, a guy, I think it might have been Augustine, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, it might have been Francis, St. Francis, Saint Francis of Assisi who said, uh, he said, tell the gospel with your life, if necessary, use words. The idea is live it, don't just talk it. And so we've we got to try to mesh those two. So he says, look, you're living your life and people see the way you're living. And I take it here that sometimes they're not really happy with the way you live. And so they're going to want to know, why do you do that? Why do you think that way? Why do you believe that? Now look, the, the temptation is just to what? It's just to reach out and let it rip. But he says, don't do that. Instead, be gentle and be respectful. In other words, don't answer anger for anger. See, our conversations are not about trying to top the other person on what we think is the other side of the fence with the best put down. That gets us nowhere with our faith. He says, be gentle. Take it down a notch. And I love this. He says, respect them. He doesn't say agree with them. He says, respect them. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. And they need the same God that you need. And listen, we need to get rid of the mentality that I think is running through Christianity right now. And that is the us first them mentality. There is no us first them. Okay? It's us with God on a mission to save them. Because you know what? We needed what they needed. And the people in the world out there, listen, God loves those people. God died for those people in the person of Jesus. And we were those people one time. 
And now we're children of God. And now God's wanting to use us. And, and by the way, um, I want to say this in the right way. And I want to be careful. I've got a long way to go with seeing what happens with my children. Uh, so I am no parenting expert today. Okay? But I will say this, and, and I've, I've learned it from my own way I was parented. And I, what I'm trying to do is... Parenting can be extremely stressful. It makes you want to pull your hair out sometimes. Yes, it's true. And sometimes you look and think, gosh, I have tried and I have tried and I what well, I'm getting. Gentleness and respectfulness will go further than anger could now. It will. Okay? And so let me help you. So I'm sure you I do that all the time, right? No, my I well, got couple kids in here today. If you ask them, they would say, no, I don't. There's times I'm not very gentle, and sometimes I've not been very respectful. You know what that is? That's when you go and say, I'm sorry. That'll go a long way, too. Okay? But when you think about our attitude, this will carry a long way in how we're able to influence for Jesus. And then one last word to think about, and that is, it's the word God. And here's what I want you to just recognize. No matter what place we find ourselves at, good or bad, God is with his people. He's always with his people. Okay? He's not only there when it's good, he's there when it's bad. I told you I've been reading through the book of Daniel. There is a phrase that shows up in the book of Daniel over and over and over. And it kind of sets the tone for the book. How can a 15 or 17 year old kid who has basically lost everything, he will never see his family again, he will never go home again, live in that darkness and not be bitter and angry and hateful and wonder what in the world's going on and why should I serve a God that lets this happen? I'm going to give you that answer because Daniel has it in his book. This phrase pops up over and over and over. He lived it and he believed it and it was God rules in the kingdom of men. God rules in the kingdoms of men. No, do I know how he works everything? Nope, and neither did he. Oh, here's what we know. God rules. God is over it. God is running it. I am not alone. And listen, we can be the church no matter what state our nation is in. We can be the church no matter who sits in the White House or who owns the parties. It doesn't matter. We can be the church we're called to be. Why? Because the God we have is always the same God. And he rules in all the kingdoms of so take heart with that today. Whether it's your work as an influencer in your home, or it's on the job where it's tough, hey, God's still the same God. He promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So let's think a minute about our influence here as we close up today. Let's think about our attitudes, and everybody will have to wrestle with these individually. How's your attitude? How is it when you're with people that just pick away at your faith? How is it when you're in the home and you're frazzled and it's been a hard day and those kids are just pulling at you and they need one more thing? I know this is hard. But we need to think deeply about our attitudes to be good influencers. And let's wrestle with this one. Have we compromised somewhere? Is there just an area where God says, uh-uh, that's my line. And you're tempted or you're walking close to that line or over. Listen, we will never affect a world for Christ if we don't honor Christ's word. It just doesn't work. Because when we dishonor his word, we make Christ less than he is. And we make him say less than he says. We don't want to do that. And last of all, can I just encourage you this morning, just stay at it, stay faithful. One of the biggest words in the Bible is perseverance. Staying at it, and particularly those that are parents. Hey, don't give up. God doesn't settle all of his accounts in one day. Keep sowing. The Bible says you'll reap. You'll reap. 
down the line. Why? Because you're faithful at that? No, because faithful is he who called us. And the Bible says he will do it. So let me encourage you today, whether it's in the home or whether it's out somewhere in the marketplace, look, we're called to be influencers. Let's influence well for Jesus while we have time. Father, this morning, would you help us to live out the essence of what it means to be a disciple, and that is to be an influencer. It is to take what we know of you, what we've learned of you, and what you've done for us, and then share that and bring it into our world that is dark, our world that needs light and salt. Would you help us to do this well? And Father, most of all, may we see that the place this starts for many of us is just right in our own homes as parents with our kids. And Father, may we take hope. None of us are perfect parents, but we have a perfect God. He's able to multiply our work, cause it to be blessed and bear fruit. Father, we ask that you would do that for us in all ways, at all times. So we pray it in the name of Jesus today. Amen. Amen. Um, please would you all stand with me as we sing our last song. And before we get into it, I would like to share two verses. Um, let me use the folder real quick. I have one hand. Um, it's from 1 Peter, where we were today. Right around the verses we were, just around the edges. Um, so 1 Peter 3, 17 and 4, 13. It says, For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And 4.13 says, But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So as we're going into this last song, I just want to still be thinking about what is God's will? And it's so worth it, even when you have to suffer for what is good, because God will have the glory and the reward for you um, after you go through that suffering. So... Let's sing about God's will. I'm so confused And I know I hurt you loud and clear So I follow Somehow I ended up here. I don't want to think I may never understand that my broken heart was a part of your plan. When I try to pray, all I got is hurt.
says, uh, you're God and I'm not. What a great lesson to learn. It's hard, isn't it? But it takes a lot of the weight off when you remember that somebody's there to help you. Hey, moms, as you leave today, uh, again, please remember to pick up the small gift we have for you. And I want to take a moment again and thank Jessica and St. John. She's right over here and see her when I first got up and said it. So I apologize. But thank you so much for making this for our mothers. If you get a chance, you can thank her yourself. Let me pray over us and we'll head into this day. Father, again, we thank you for your grace and your mercy to us that you would call us into your family. And Lord, may our hearts grasp what your heart does, and that is the love for this world that needs Christ. May we love those who do not know Christ. May our hearts desire to shine the light of Christ's love and salt with his truth in this world. And Lord, we ask out of that that you would influence others for your kingdom. Lord, we pray for our moms today. Be with them. Bless them on this day. And thank you for them. And Lord, we head out this week looking to serve you in whatever capacity and opportunity that you give us. May our, may our spiritual eyes and hearts be attuned to look for it. I pray that in Jesus' today. Amen and amen. Have a great day. Have a good week. Thanks, John.